God's authority takes control when God's people humble themselves. An ironic twist. Getting to know the Persian kings. And comets, an age indicator of the solar system. All of this and more coming up next on Quick Study Television. Stay there. Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, wherever you are. My name is Rod Hembry. I'm Janice. And this is the Quick Study Television program, a program that is delighted to take you through the Bible. We're going to do that today. We've been doing it every day as we, as we have kept in touch chronologically, different this year. And today we're going to be focused on Esther chapter 7 to chapter 8. We're going to study Esther chapter 8 verses 1 to 10. And if you join me, we're going to learn that God's authority takes control when God's people humble themselves. We're going to talk about that and more all coming up on today's program. Plus, Corey is here with Cosmic Mysteries and also History from the Bible. Yes, today we are going to be taking a look at Xerxes, the uh, husband king of Queen Esther. Who was he and what did he do? All right, Xerxes is a very interesting guy, and we're going to be talking about cosmic mysteries. Ryan, what are you up to? Well, today we're talking comets. Now, did you know that we can use them to help us determine the age of our solar system? That and more later. Comets, really? Mm -hmm. Comets. Okay, so what do we have for Do You Know? Well, by order of the king, do you know who was hanged on the gallows Haman built? All this and more coming up on today's Quick Study program. Stay there. Right now, you and I are going to be using records from history to fill in some of the blanks that the Bible leaves out about King Xerxes of Persia. I hope you find it as interesting as I do. To establish the history of the biblical book of Esther, one pivotal person must be examined, Esther's king husband. In the first two verses of Esther, Ahasuerus is said to be king of the Persian Empire, having his capital city at Susa and ruling 127 provinces from India in the east to Kush in the southwest. All of these statements are critical to identifying historical Ahasuerus as Xerxes, the fifth king of the United Media Persian Empire. Cyrus the Great was the founder, the first king of this Persian Empire as a world power. He is given historical shoutouts in the books of 2 Chronicles, Ezra, Isaiah, and Daniel. His son, Cambyses II, ruled after him for eight years, until his untimely death allowed a several-month-long imposter to take the throne. This apparent usurper was finally laid to rest by Cambyses' spear-bearer, the new king, Darius. This Darius changed many things. He divided the empire into satraps and provinces, developed a professional standing army, built a new capital city at Susa, and conquered territory all the way into ancient India. After his death, his son Xerxes takes the throne of a Persian empire that is exactly how Esther describes it. Its territory extended to India and its capital city, Susa. In the book of Daniel, chapter 11, verse 2, written during Cyrus's reign, it is prophesied that Xerxes will be a king that stirs up the empire against Greece. This 
happened. The ancient historian Herodotus writes much about King Xerxes' wars against Greece. One of the most famous battles in all of history was fought during Xerxes' invasion. The Battle of Thermopylae under Spartan King Leonidas. 300 soldiers fought to the death to delay Xerxes' army. Esther saves the lives of Jews in 127 provinces across the empire of Persia. It is a remarkable act of authority based upon the events of King Ahasuerus. This is the troubled kingdom with the order to seek the life of every Jewish slave. Well, Queen Esther gets authority back and troubles the work of Haman. Haman is gone, but his trouble is not. It was from Satan. Satan is not gone. Yet although the difficult time comes, Esther and Mordecai ramp up to revenge the rebels in the kingdom. Superheroes know, and they understand, this is a supernatural counterattack that takes everyone by surprise. Esther chapter 8, verses 1 through 10. On that day, King Ahasuerus gave Queen Esther the house of Haman, the enemy of the Jews. And Mordecai came before the king, for Esther had told how he was related to her. So the king took off his signet ring, which he had taken from Haman, and gave it to Mordecai. And Esther appointed Mordecai over the house of Haman. Now Esther spoke again to the king, fell down at his feet, and implored him with tears to counteract the evil of Haman the Agagite and the scheme which he had devised against the Jews. And the king held out the golden scepter toward Esther. So Esther arose and stood before the king and said, If it pleases the king, and if I have found favor in his sight, and the thing seems right to the king, and I am pleasing in his eyes. Let it be written to revoke the letters devised by Haman, the son of Hamadatha, the Agagite, which he wrote to annihilate the Jews who are in all the king's provinces. For how can I endure to see the evil that will come to my people? Or how can I endure to see the destruction of my countrymen? Then King Ohazarus said to Queen Esther and Mordecai the Jew, Indeed, I have given Esther the house of Haman, and they have hanged him on the gallows, because he tried to lay his hand on the Jews. You yourselves write a decree concerning the Jews as you please in the king's name, and seal it with the king's signet ring. For whatever is written in the king's name and sealed with the king's signet ring no one can revoke. So the king's scribes were called at that time in the third month, which is the month of Sivan on the twenty-third day, and it was written, according to all that Mordecai commanded, to the Jews, the satraps, the governors, and the princes of the provinces from India to Ethiopia, one hundred and twenty-seven provinces in all, to every province in its own script to every people in their own language, and to the Jews in their own script and language. And he wrote in the name of King Ohazarus, sealed it with the king's signet ring, and sent letters by couriers on horseback, riding on royal horses bred from swift steeds. Esther chapter 8, verses 1 through 10. This is Quick Study Television, Bible Discovery TV. We are talking about Esther. Esther is an important passage in the Bible. It's a great book of the Bible, one of the 66, which I encourage you to read. Now, we're reading the Bible chronologically this year, and Esther is an important part of that read. Now, the Jews, they're in exile, and they're not coming back yet, but we have this time when Esther is an orphan girl 
That's not a real name, by the way. An orphan girl who is in the palace of the king, and he is excited about her. He calls her Esther, and so the book is called Esther. Very interesting. And I want to encourage you to read it through. Make time for this today. Now, they say this is the only book of the Bible where you don't see the name of God in it, but I want to tell you, you do. But that's another story. This is called Strong Authority, and this is the response that Esther had was positive. She made the truth known, and we're going to see this in just a moment. This is the reading assignment is Esther chapter 7 to 8. If you read this today, you will catch up on your chronological work of reading the Bible through. We're going to focus on Esther chapter 8, verses 1 to 10. We're not going to get to all of it because there are four points. We're going to cover three. The reason is for time. We're going to get into it right now. As we focus on Esther chapter 8, verses 1 and 2, the Bible says this. On that day, King Ahasuerus gave Queen Esther the house of Haman. Haman was destroyed, the enemy of the Jews. Now Mordecai came before the king, for Esther had told how he was related to her. So there's a lot going on. So the king took off his signet ring, which he had taken from Haman, and he gave it to Mordecai. And Esther appointed Mordecai over the house of Haman. Isn't that interesting? Who was Haman? Well, Haman was the guy who wanted to destroy the Jews. He was the guy who said, let's kill them, let's get rid of them. And there was a lot going on. That's why you need to read it. A lot going on to happen. But it turns out God switched it. And now it happens that Mordecai is over his house. That's a very interesting turn of events. That brings me to this point. God's authority takes control when God's people are obedient to God's word and his ways. The truth is that in this passage and in this book, we see this from beginning to end. God is simply telling his people, take control. And when God sees the people take authority uh, to, to dress up on it, he says, I reward you with the results of that authority. That's interesting. So that brings me to the next point as we are to the next scripture as we focus on this. This is chapter 8, verses 3 to 6. And it says, now Esther spoke again to the king. Esther fell down at his feet and implored him with tears to counteract the evil of Haman, who's dead now, uh, the, the Agite, and the scheme which he had devised against the Jews. Now remember, that scheme is still out there. That letter went out. And so the king of held out his golden scepter towards Esther. So Esther arose and stood before the king and said, If it pleases the king, and if I have found favor in his sight, and the thing seems right to the king, and I am pleasing in his eyes, let it be written to revoke the letters devised by Haman, the son of Hamadah. And the Agite, and with which he wrote to annihilate the Jews who are in the king's provinces. For how can I endure to see that evil that would, will come to my people? Or how can I endure to see the destruction of my countrymen? And here's the point. See, Esther, she, she humbles herself before the king. Authority takes control when God's people humble themselves before the king. And she humbles herself before the king. She's not trying to hold up herself as some great... No, no, she humbles herself and she says, King, I can't bear this. I can't do this. And the king in this moment says nothing but simply stretches out his staff to her and the grant is given. That is impressive. Now, here we have an example of God's people in the place of influence. See, a lot of people want authority and all of that, but God's people have the place of influence influence. Now that means this. It means they can influence things to the right degree. Now that brings me to this next passage, which we're going to get into. Then King Ahasuerus said to Queen Esther and Mordecai, the Jew, indeed, I have given Esther the house of Haman and they have hanged him on the gallows because he tried to lay his hands on the Jews. Now listen, listen. You yourselves write a decree concerning the Jews as you please in the king's name and seal it with a king's signet ring. For whatever is written in the king's name 
and sealed with the king's signet ring, no one can revoke. Isn't that interesting? That's why the king, he cannot pull the letters back. The letters were sent out by Haman. He can't pull them back because they're all in the midst of that. And, and if he pulls it back, he's made a mistake. Kings cannot be perceived to make a mistake. So he says, write a new letter and send it out. They did. And the letter was amazing. He said, Jews, take up all of your uh, tools and anybody who tries to resist you, fight them. That was amazing. So this brings me to this point. Authority takes great effect when people of God Know and understand that life is precious in the eyes of God. This is an amazing thing. Uh, here we have a book that seems to not mention the name of God, but in all of the subtext, the undertext, and everything else, God is there. And so God is evident, He is available, He is ready, and He is willing to make Himself known to you. Now, I submit to you today that this is available for the persecuted church. And I claim in the name of Jesus Christ, it can be available for those who love Jesus Christ and who serve Him today. in the program, you and I found out about Xerxes, king of Persia, also known as Ahasuerus. Well, right now, we are going to continue on learning about different kings of Persia that interact and show up in the records of the Bible. The time period of Persian dominance in the Bible ranges from King Cyrus the Great, who united the Persian Empire and conquered Babylon, to Artaxerxes I, four kings later during the lives of biblical figures Ezra and Nehemiah. The Bible's history covers these five Persian kings from the point of view of the exiles. Cyrus the Great was prophesied by Isaiah and Jeremiah as a rescuer of the people of God, which ancient records and findings in archaeology have upheld as truth. Cyrus pushed the Persian Empire to the borders of Greece in the northwest to the Indus River in the east. He instituted the first documented system of governing that allowed freedom and support of the religions of conquered people. There were benefits to living under the rule of this new king, yet very swift punishments for the smallest act of rebellion. The next king of Persia was Cambyses II, Cyrus's son. He is not mentioned in the Bible and only ruled for eight years before his sudden death. His main course of action was to spread the empire by conquering Egypt. Cambyses' replacement as king was a member of the royal family, Darius. Darius reigned for 36 years and one of his decrees is recorded in the Bible. Noteworthy in his reign are his reorganization of the empire into provinces, his inventive monetary system, building projects, and his specialization of the Persian army. Darius then began the famous Greek-Persian Wars. Xerxes I, seen in the biblical book of Esther, inherited the throne from his father Darius and ruled for 21 years. He continued the attempt to conquer Greece, but he too ultimately failed. The final king of Persia mentioned in the Bible is Xerxes' son, Artaxerxes I. During his 40-year reign, Ezra and Nehemiah returned to Jerusalem to rebuild the temple and the walls. The most important thing in today's focus is understanding the Bible. The Bible is the key book that transcends countries in the world. It tells us the way in which the world is heading. Quick Study TV is designed to make the book the premier document. We do that through many ways. One of the primary ways is through media. Now, the Bible is a 32-page print companion every month that is unique in presentation. Every guide is original or new, no guide is the same. We recommend that you get a copy of this today. Write to P.O. Box 150, Murraysville, Pennsylvania, 15668-0150. In Canada, write to P.O. Box 456, 
Orangeville, Ontario, L9W5G2. You can call us on the phone and reserve your copy today. Call 724-733-8336 or 519-940-8338. And remember, you can get a hold of the Bible Commentary on the website, BibleDiscoveryTV.com. Good morning, good afternoon. Frym Rod Hembry along with Janice, and we are here, and I want to tell you what we're going to study next time on Quick Study Television Program. We're looking at Ezra 7 through 8. We're going to study something that tells us men of understanding are required when God's special forces are needed. What in the world are we talking about? All that and more coming up next time on Quick Study Television. Make sure you're there. Here, of course, is Ryan with Cosmic Mysteries. Ryan, what's up? So there's two very different views. One view is that the solar system and universe evolved over billions of years, and the other view is that it was created only thousands of years ago in only six days by a creator. Now, the cool thing is that we can take a look at some of the celestial objects like planets, moons, stars, and galaxies, and apply these two different views to the observational data we can acquire. Then we're going to apply this sort of thinking to comets. Let's study. Comets are found in orbit around the sun. They have very odd orbital paths, with part of the orbital path being closer to the sun and the other part being farther away. A comet spends most of its time farther away from the sun. This is because as a comet makes its close approach to the sun, it speeds up. Then as it moves farther away from the sun, it slows down. But what exactly is a comet? They are actually balls of ice and dirt. A comet has a solid center called the nucleus and an outer fog called the coma. This fog is comprised of vaporized materials. As a comet makes its close approach to the sun, it speeds up and slingshots around it. This causes a tail of vaporized material. A lot of times, two tails develop, an ion tail, which is made up of light charged particles, and a dust tail. The ion tail is blue in color, while the dust tail is white and usually curved. Due to the solar wind and radiation, the comet's tail points directly away from the sun. These tails mean that the comets are losing material, and therefore cannot last forever. Comets are estimated to only be able to last 100,000 years at the most before all the material is gone. Comets are in agreement with the biblical timescale of 6,000 years. But this is a problem for those who believe the universe is over four and a half billion years old. So what added idea have the secular astronomers come up with? They've come up with the Oort cloud. This Oort cloud supposedly has a reserve of icy masses orbiting far away from the sun. Every once in a while, one of these icy masses falls into the inner solar system and becomes a new comet. But as with all the other conjecture naturalists have come up with, this has never been observed. If you believe in the Genesis account, then you have no need to believe in some Oort cloud. In looking at all the scientific evidence that's been discovered about the moon, the earth, the planets, spiral galaxies, and comets, it is seen that there are no contradictions when using the Bible as your worldview. Furthermore, there is no added conjecture necessary. Every one of these celestial objects has forced the secular astronomer to come up with conjecture to explain away a young universe. But the fact is, Using the Bible as your guide makes everything very clear. So the question is, who is the one believing in fairy tales? The Bible believer, or the one who comes up with these fictional ideas? The reality is that those who hold to the view that the universe is billions of years old have a really tough time explaining a lot of the observable celestial objects, not just comets. Now, unfortunately, I've run out of time on TV, but if you'd like more on this, then you should sign up for my online course at Bible Discovery Seminary and College. Bible Discover Discovery Seminary and College, mm -hmm. or Discovery Seminary Online, is designed for people who are students online to get into that. Thank you, Ryan, an excellent report, very good. Very good. Mm -hmm. Janice, what do you have for Do You Know? Well, by order of the king, do you know who was hanged on the gallows that Haman built? All right, who was hanged on, on Haman's gallows? Corey? The answer is Haman himself. Wow, Haman himself mm -hmm. was hung on that puppy. Quite 
an ironic <laughs> twist. In fact, it was. The Bible says that they were 50 cubits high, and Haman had such a hate for Mordecai that when it was suggested that he build these, right away he gave the order. He gave the order immediately. Mm -hmm. That's amazing. That's interesting. Well, that's all the story in Esther, and we're going to be going on Ezra on the next time. But mm -hmm. I wanted to remind you as well that we can get a hold of. Now, we need your help uh, to continue on Quick Study. We must have your help. And what you want to do is write to P.O. Box 150, Murraysville, Pennsylvania, 15668-0150. In Canada, write to P.O. Box 456, Orangeville, Ontario, L9W. 5G2. You can call at God rewards the faithful. It doesn't matter where, how, or when the faithful of God are rewarded. Esther lived in a time of great evil. She was an exile youth woman with no parents in a time when anything could be done to her. She was faithful to do what God told her and follow where God placed her. There is great strength for life when we submit to the will of God and consider the place God puts us then we will be faithful and God will reward us. So with that, we pray it this way, Lord, I will choose to be faithful to you always. In our Strength in Your Mind segment, we have a great Bible quote for you. Listen to this. Where does the Bible actually say? So Samuel called to the Lord, and the Lord was sent, uh, the Lord sent thunder and rain that day, and all the people greatly feared. Where in the world is that talk about? There, here's, an, here's a hint. It says Samuel. So you might want to think about that. And if you think you know the answer, go to BibleDiscoveryTV.com and click on Strengthen Your Mind or wait for the discovery letter. It'll come and all those messages will be put in there. Do you know who Jesus Christ is? Jesus Christ is not some guy on a cross on the wall. He's not on the cross. He rose again. Jesus Christ is free from the cross, and he was after three days. And he came that you might have life and have it more abundantly. Do you have life abundantly? If you don't, then why don't you pray and say, Jesus, forgive me of my sin and give me life. I believe you died on the cross and rose again. Help me. Thank you for joining us today on the Quick Study Bible Discovery TV broadcast. I'd like to remind you that our Bible Discovery Seminary is for people just like you. Courses at your own choice, creation, science, Bible, archaeology, much more. BibleDiscoveryTV.com.